Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our live webcast. This is our first time hosting this type of engagement to you, our supporters. So thank you for taking some time to spend with us and learn about how COVID-19 is affecting the not-for-profit sector. First and foremost, I hope that your families are healthy and safe. The impact of this crisis has certainly taken a great toll on all of us, not just here in Halton and Hamilton, but obviously around the country and across the globe. It's wreaking havoc on people's lives, families, and of course, the economy. I've been giving a lot of thought to how we collectively respond to crisis. And at a time when most of the world has slowed, this is a time when your United Way ramps up. We've been active, advocating at the national level for emergency funding, and we've been successful in securing significant funds to invest locally. We've been helping local agencies expand capacity and pivot their programs. We've been working with and collaborating with other funders so we can understand how to make the best and most impactful investments. We're working with all levels of government to reinforce the sheer impact on our communities. And of course, we've launched our COVID-19 emergency fund which is getting close to surpassing $100,000, and we're investing that money quickly back into our communities to ensure the supports are there for our most vulnerable individuals. Because through our work, we know that those most vulnerable are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. We know that physical distancing is particularly difficult to practice when you live in poverty, as many rely on public transit or food banks or shelters places where people have to congregate. We must also consider the mental strain this pandemic is placing on those who are already isolated, such as seniors, as well as those working on the front lines, exposing themselves to significant risk of contracting the virus. It's a pleasure to be here today with some of our strongest community leaders. Today, it's my hope that you'll gain insight from three incredible agencies representing some of the 65 agencies and 129 local programs that we work with daily. We're digging deep to understand the needs of our changing community so that our families, friends, and neighbors have what they need to overcome this enormous crisis. Everything we do is rooted in our mission statement, to improve lives, build community, and ignite action. We need to collectively work together to uncover the tools and strategies for our entire communities to move forward, not only during this pandemic, but also in that new reality that awaits us once this crisis subsides, because things will be different. And we anticipate a sharp increase in those accessing the social safety net. So at this time, I'd like to introduce you to our panel moderator, someone who uh, many of you will recognize. Mike is our Senior Director of Community Impact. Mike Mikulak, I'm gonna pass the camera over to you. Thank you, Brad. Um, so a lot of people are asking some pretty important questions right now. How will we deal with this crisis? How many people will die? How, what does this mean for my job? What will happen to the economy? Personally, I'm wondering how teachers manage 30 students when I can barely manage two of my own kids. And ultimately, I think a lot of people are asking, what is an essential worker? And I think two months ago, many of us would not have said grocery store clerk or delivery driver, but it's become clear in the last month that we live in an economy that is profoundly interconnected and perhaps a lot more vulnerable and less resilient than we thought. A lot has changed in the last month and as we pause and reflect, I hope that a lot more change for the good will emerge. I really believe that crisis is an opportunity to reflect and pause and to rebuild more thoughtfully. And I know during this time of social distancing, I've been doing a lot of personal reflection and thinking about what I want to keep, what I want to discard, and what the future looks like. And I'm preaching to the choir, but we know that the nonprofit sector is essential. But what is being revealed right now is how much strain the sector is under and the extent to which we as a society have underinvested in a critical safety net. 
While we should have been trying to turn safety nets into trampolines, instead, we've allowed bigger and bigger holes to appear and people are falling through. So today, I wanna to talk about some of the issues facing the most vulnerable members of the community and how your support of our Community Investment Fund and the COVID Emergency Fund is literally saving lives. So in a way, I think what COVID is giving us is a unique opportunity and insight into the anatomy of the nonprofit sector. It's like an X-ray peering beneath the skin. We are seeing stress fractures buckle under the increased loads and the result of decades of downloading more and more onto the charitable sector. Ultimately, you can't do more with less. Something has to give. And today's panel discussion is gonna give you some insights into the unique challenges COVID has presented us. And what, what changes have we seen as a result of this pandemic? What does it reveal about the path forward? And what are we doing at the United Way to respond? That's what I wanna talk about today. So first and foremost, and I think most of you uh, understand this, our sector is built on volunteers. It, that's literally the foundation. And this is both a strength and a weakness. And some of our panelists are going to be talking about this. Jamie in particular from the Welcome In will be talking about this later. But our sector relies on volunteers. It relies on them for cr critical labor. It relies on them for raising funds. It relies on them for so many different things. Um, one of our programs that we support in Oakville, Meals on Wheels, relies on quite elderly volunteers to deliver those meals to other individuals. And they're having a hard time right now keeping people safe and, and really sort of balancing the needs of the community with balancing the safety of their volunteers. This is incredibly challenging and introduces huge complexity to operations that are already running very smoothly and efficiently. We also know that right now revenue models are being upturned. We tend to think of the nonprofit sector as being primarily grant driven but many of our agencies actually run social enterprises. They run cafes, thrift stores, daycares, and fee-for-service programming that really funds a lot of the work that they're doing. And a lot of those things are having to close down. Again, Jamie will talk about this a little bit later, but many of our agencies are facing that. I think of particular of an organization like Catholic Youth uh, Organization in Hamilton that offers day camp and school services. They literally have no income from that anymore. And that's providing a big challenge. It's also fundamentally changing some of the care models. These are being upended. So we don't live online. And for people with disabilities, limited access to technologies or seniors, I think you know it's show, Zoom isn't the answer. And as much as we joke that people are stuck to their phones, I think a lot of people are realizing that that face-to-face -face connection, there really is no, um, there, there's really no alternative to that. And because our sector is so relational, um, it's very difficult to go digital. And I'm encouraged by actually seeing some of the creativity that is emerging as a result of this, that to fulfill that basic need for human connection, we're seeing a lot of agencies really pivot and flex. So Community Living Burlington, for example, is utilizing one of the programs that we started recently, which is a community donation stream that connects corporate donations with, um, with, with uh, our community agencies. And they're actually taking laptops and ukuleles and providing them to their group home participants who were used to having programming where they got together and did things and are now are now going to be hosting virtual um, music lessons as a result of this and that need that fundamental need for human connection we have to find ways around it and we're seeing a lot of creativity around this but for some there really is no way around this and a lot of agencies are having to make very hard choices about balancing the physical safety of their participants and and the needs of, of, of things like drug treatment programs that are unable to run um, as a result of these things or that are running in very minimal ways. And, and, and this is gonna have some long-term impacts. I think what we're seeing is you know, something that, that has been on a lot of people's minds, which is the effect of social isolation. And this isn't the same as social distancing. Social isolation has profound health effects. It can actually be as bad for you as smoking. And, pro, and often programs, we think of programs like food banks and drop-in programming and exercising as being sort of, you know, have outcomes like food security. 
but they're often actually leveraging those opportunities to connect people, to ensure that they're coming together and coming out of their homes and breaking some of that, uh, some of that social isolation. And so we're gonna, we're, I think what we're gonna see is a sleeping giant beneath the COVID crisis, which is a, a mental health crisis. And we're gonna see a lot of, a lot of issues come up with that. And, and we'll be hearing C from CMHA Hamilton later to talk about this. But I think you know, what leaves a lot of hope um, for me is that I'm, I'm seeing our agencies and our community really rally around the art of the pivot. People are changing their plans, they're moving on, they're really, reacting quite quickly and crisis i think you know it's difficult but it also brings out the best of us we're seeing things like care mongering groups uh and inc and the incredible generosity of our donors as brad said our emergency fund has already uh is, is approaching a hundred thousand dollars already and we've seen donors come up to help us fill in gaps in in in, in the campaign that are truly phenomenal so what I want to talk about a little bit is as we move from crisis to resilience, what does that mean? So what is resilience? We hear this term a lot. And to me, resilience is the ability to maintain function despite so shocks to a, a system. A system is resilient when it can provide some sort of desired output, even under changing circumstances. And this is something that the United Way has really been looking at um, on, on a sector level through our community impact strategy and framework and a number of strategic initiatives over the last few years. And we know that in order for a system to be, to be resilient, we need a certain base level of stability. And so thanks to your generous donations, we are able to maintain funding this year despite recent shocks. And we, uh, and it shows how resilient our community is when driven by compassion and care. But we also need, we also know that we need to be flexible. And so one of the first things that we did as an organization was to extend flexibility to our agencies to say, we know that things are changing. We know that the plans you have made are not the same. We know that you need to pivot. And so we are extending um, flexibility to our agencies so that they can reallocate towards those needs that are more pressing right now. We also know that we need to raise more funds, both in the short term and in the long term. And so our emergency fund has already is already mobilizing emergency dollars to fund in those, those unforeseen expenses that are coming up, whether it's cleaning supplies or food or dealing with wait lists. But as Brad said, we are also advocating. So we've been working with our partners across the country to advocate for some significant dollars to flow into our community. So over $200,000 will be flowing into our community to support isolated seniors over the next few week and weeks. And we are speaking with politicians to ensure that the bailouts that are coming for our companies are also coming for the charitable sector. We are also connecting um, organizations. So our donation stream is working very hard right now to support frontline workers and their clients. And we've been able to connect over $40,000 in cleaning supplies, dog food, diapers, menstrual hygiene products, and laptops to crucial services on the front line. We're even, and, and, and I think, you know, in an in, in a equally beneficial way, we're connecting things like musical instruments and toys and creating care packages for frontline staff. I'm also really excited by some of the coordination that's happening as a result of this. So we are working actively with other task forces and roundtables and grantors with other, other funders to make sure that we understand the crisis in real time and that we're able to coordinate our efforts and where one funder might not be able to fund something, another funder can step in and, and, and provide that. And this is incredible, the kind of work that's happening here. And we're seeing some collaboration um, that, is, that is truly heartening and that I hope will continue as we move forward. And as we get through the worst of this, I think we're all of us are thinking about what's over the horizon. So how do we maintain, how do we focus in on recovery and resilience? And I think the good news is that a lot of what we've been working on over the last two years, as we've been, as, as we've been sh shifting and pivoting towards a more impact focused organization are really starting to pay dividends. We were in the middle of, of revamping and launching a new community impact framework that really did focus on balancing maintenance and innovation. So that long-term stable funding with sort of with smart risk taking and structured collaboration. And we're we're seeing that this was the right path to take. So things like flexibility built into our new framework. So offering root agent rooted agencies five years of funding and a fair amount of flexibility in to be able to shift between programming 
we're seeing the need for that right now. We're seeing our agencies being able to pivot because of that kind of flexibility, and that and that is good. We've also seen that when it comes to uh, social innovation, that we recently launched our social innovation labs that focused in on social enterprise and design thinking and keeping that end user in mind and really leveraging partnerships with universities and colleges and coordinating and leveraging applied research so that we can so that we can support the nonprofit sector even though we've had to pivot we see the value of that at these uh, in these times and when it comes to to initiatives and strategic initiatives like financial empowerment where we're providing free tax filing options for low income individuals and providing financial literacy support so that they know what benefits they're entitled to and that they can access them uh, as easily as possible. And the kinds of partnerships that we're leveraging through universities and other institutions to be able to make that as simple as possible and to meet people where they're at. Again, this is really important that we that we think in the short and the long term and that we balance these things out. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited actually for, for some of the things that we'll be able to do afterwards. So in closing, I want I want to I, I you know I refer to this crisis as a kind of X-ray that is revealing the anatomy of our communities and economies. The crisis is lifting the veil on some pretty important things, and I want you to take a moment and consider the following: What did it feel like to go to the grocery store and experience empty shelves? For one in ten people in our community, that is a daily experience, a component of their lives that does not go away. Empty shelves are not are are the norm for them. That feeling you had when you saw no more toilet paper or, or eggs or milk is normal for people in our community. Think about that next time you go to Costco to stock up for, the, for another potential lockdown. Stocking up and sheltering in space is not a luxury that many in our community can afford. If you were homeless, facing abuse, or living with six other people in a small rooming house, there is no escape. And this is why we are working with our partners to provide coordinated enhanced relief in food security and emergency provisions. And thanks to your donation and support, we are able to get out more food to families and individuals in need. And we are working with our partners to enhance home delivery options, coordinate efforts and increase supply. Because of your support, our emergency fund will have provided more money and more resources that target those emergency needs. And for many of us, we are also experiencing something else that is all too normal of an experience for many people in our community, and that's precarious employment. And for people in the gig economy or who have part-time jobs, this is the norm. Over the last 20 years, precarious employment has increased over 50% across Canada. And for young people in particular, this is especially hard. The reality of COVID is very different for those of us who are precariously employed and have no paid sick leave, no benefits, no salary if they fall sick. Sadly, many of our frontline workers fall into this category. And I think many people are realizing that we are all vulnerable and that this safety net has to catch us all. So now you're gonna have a chance to hear some stories from the front lines. So I wanna welcome our three panelists and we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion here and you're gonna hear some stories. So Jamie Vanderberg, He's the executive director of Welcome In Community Center, Melissa Cameron of Acclaim Health, and Peter Blumendahl of Canadian Mental Health Association. Each of them is going to speak for five minutes to give you a sense of how their organizations are reacting to the crisis and how it has impacted their clients. So we're going to begin with Jamie. Jamie um, is the executive director of Welcome In Community Center. Collaboration and community involvement are two of Jamie's most significant passions. As the executive director of Welcome In Community Center, he is constantly looking for ways to work with other organizations and involve all community members in the work they do in the north end of, uh, of uh, Hamilton. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you. For those of us on the front lines, the COVID-19 crisis has triggered actually a great deal of fear. And we see the fear on the faces of community members who access our food bank, not knowing how on earth they're gonna feed their kids. We see the fear in the voices of the seniors uh, when we call them on a now everyday basis. We see the fear in the eyes of our own staff who desperately don't wanna bring the virus home with them to their kids, but are very committed to, to being a part of the response. 
Welcome in Community Center is attempting to quiet the fear and respond in really significant ways to the increasing need caused in uh, the community by this crisis. It's true that, uh, and you mentioned this, that we have had to suspend our United Way funded children's programs and close our social enterprise focused thrift store. Financially, this has huge implications for us because that's $12,000 of sales gone uh, every month. And it's heartbreaking to see uh, lose some of the contact with the kids in the community. We've also had to make the very difficult decision to tell our volunteers to stay home. Welcome In is kind of in a unique place where most of our 350 volunteers are community members that access our programs on a, on a daily basis and they're vulnerable and their health and their safety has always been our top priority. So despite having to lose these volunteers, our food bank was run by one staff and a team of 50 volunteers. We've had to uh, reassign our small staff team, hire five new staff in the last two weeks, and expand other aspects of our services in order to meet the very basic needs of Hamiltonians. So our food bank has expanded its hours of operations. Not only have we, um, are we open longer each day, we've added an extra day to provide barrier free access for the city's most marginalized community members including but not limited to the trans community and homeless individuals. Our food bank has shifted to a grab and go hamper style food bank. So there's less choice involved, but it does reduce the risk of transmission and keep our community members safer. And for those who cannot access the food bank, and this was a major new development for us, for those who cannot access the food bank because they're quarantined or have mobility issues, we are, have been working with the city of Hamilton for the last number of weeks to ensure that emergency food hampers are delivered directly to people's front door. Now, I actually had the opportunity myself to do one of these deliveries. I, I, it was a random one that I could do on my way home. Um, and I happened to drop it off and through an open window, I had a chance to speak with the single mom who was inside. The mom was sick maybe with COVID, maybe not. It was before the time when there were adequate tests available and she didn't qualify. And she was told she couldn't leave her house. I could hear the kids playing inside through the open window. It was clear that she was having an incredibly difficult time trying to keep them entertained, make sure they were fed, and try to find time to rest and recover from whatever ailed her. She was so incredibly grateful on that Friday afternoon for the delivered food, food that arrived right on her front door, food that she had no other way of getting. So incredibly grateful. In addition to emergency food hampers, Welcomein is working with other partners uh, and we'll be piloting a project this week, actually starting this week, that will see emergency prepared meals delivered to the front doors of those in need. Now there's uh, some details that need to be worked out and nothing's being made quite public at this point, so I can't say too much more about the program, but we do know that all the partners are deeply committed to getting prepared meals into the hands of those that need them. For isolated and vulnerable seniors, because we have a fairly active seniors program at Welcome In, we've gathered a dynamic team of volunteers, and instead of doing face-to-face -face visits with our, our isolated seniors, we're now calling them on a daily basis. And we've partnered again with the city of Hamilton to get emergency food hampers delivered directly to their doors. But we've managed to take that a step further and we're now arranging for the delivery of personal items and medications. And, and really importantly, even things like puzzles and coloring books for seniors in need. Because for seniors who are isolated, um, well, isolation, to be quite honest, is a matter of life and death. When it comes to community development, Welcome In has always focused, literally always focused on the people that make up our community. For us, relationships matter and, and to treat people with dignity and respect is of utmost importance. We believe as a community center that uh, there is a vibrant and, and more meaningful path forward for all members of our community if we work together. And so bringing people together for that is really important. Uh, this past week, one of our seniors received an emergency food hamper. 
in that emergency food hamper, we had tucked a few essential items that the person had requested. And together with those items, we had slipped in a card that one of our children had made. So we had asked the children, put a call out for children to make cards of encouragement for those who might need them during this crisis. And earlier that week, the mom of this particular child had sent us a picture of the child hard at work, finger painting at the kitchen table and trying to put words uh, to paper of encouragement. Um, thankfully, she translated some of them and added some of her own. But on the faces, on the child's face in that picture was this huge smile. And it was clear that uh, this person was happily doing their part to break through some of the fear that this pandemic has brought. And that card was dropped off at Welcome In. It was placed in one of the emergency food hampers. And when the senior opened the card this week, he was literally thrilled. He grabbed his phone and immediately called our senior support hotline, which we started after the crisis uh, started. Um, and he called and he just wanted to say a very simple thank you and how much it meant to him. Together with so many other organizations, Welcome In, yes, it is struggling with a, a loss of volunteers and, and struggling with um, its financial situation, but it is working really hard to meet the very basic needs within our community. And these needs are, are both physical, uh, food access is, is our primary focus, but it's it's also these basic human needs are also about being in relationship with people and breaking through some of the social isolation that's being experienced. Um, so we are so thankful for any support that we get and uh, and support from United Way, especially during this uh, time is is essential. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. It's a very um, incredible story of resilience and, and, and struggle, and, and I, I, I appreciate that. Um, thank you. So please, um, our next uh, participant is Melissa Cameron. She's held leadership roles in both corporate and nonprofit sectors, and over the last seven years, she has helped Acclaim Health deliver extraordinary community care across Fulton. Hi, Mike, and hi, good morning to everybody on the call. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Acclaim Health helps about 19,000 people across Halton, and almost all of them are older adults, and almost half of them are 80 years of age or older. So given their age, um, you can imagine that COVID-19 is a really serious threat for all of our clients. And we knew that right from the very beginning of this pandemic, that the decisions we made as an organization would mean life or death uh, for the people we help. So from the very beginning, we've had to take a really hard look at everything we're doing, making sure we're providing those critical services, but also make sure we're protecting them uh, from the spread of the virus. We are actually right now caring for many people with COVID-19. Uh, both in their homes and in retirement homes. And several of them are palliative and have been discharged uh, from the hospital and sent home to our care. So uh, we are definitely in tough on this and uh, it has been very hard on our staff and our volunteers, um, but we're doing it and we're still here. And as Mike said, and as Jamie said, we found really creative ways to still provide service during this time. I think one of the things we're seeing most of all is, you know, a part no matter, on all of our clients, no matter if they have COVID-19 or not, the biggest impacts um, are really that isolation, that grief, that anxiety, and that fear. And that is something that uh, affects everybody and really affects the way people make decisions. So um, we're, we're seeing a lot of all of those things. I'm going to share uh, the story of Edith with you right now. Edith. Um, is a, a, is, a, is a wonderful woman, she's 96. She still lives in her own home. She's hardcore, Edith. I have a lot of respect for Edith. <laughs> um, she has no family though, and as she would say, as she would tell you very bluntly, all of her friends have died. So normally, um, she has a friendly visiting volunteer who visits once a week um, to check in on her and provide some human contact. But of course, now Edith is absolutely terrified of getting COVID-19 because she knows uh, it would likely kill her if she did get it. So like Jamie said, as an organization, we had to make the difficult decision to stop all in-person visits by our volunteers. 
uh, we just couldn't take the chance of a volunteer unwittingly passing on the virus or getting it themselves. So instead, uh, we have amazing volunteers who have totally stepped up and found weird and wonderful ways to still maintain that contact with their clients. Uh, Edith uh, at 96 does not know what Zoom is. There is no way we can get Edith on Zoom. So that is not going to happen. <laughs> Uh, but what her volunteer has done instead is uh, a couple of times a week she goes and stands on Edith's driveway and Edith is behind her screen door and they chat for a few minutes. Um, Edith is terrified of leaving her home right now so she's not going to the grocery store so we've had to arrange porch drops of groceries. Um, and one of Edith's pastime is knitting so she loves to knit so we've done some porch drops of wool as well. And she's actually knitting socks right now, warm socks for some of our COVID-19 patients um, that then we're porch dropping elsewhere. So I, I think Jamie talked about this a little bit as well, but for seniors who are living completely alone and don't have support networks of friends and family checking in on them, um, trying to stay busy and find purpose uh, in this time, it's been four weeks already, um, that's really important. Um, and her volunteer is calling her every day. And I think you may think that's a phone call, but for Edith, um, when I talked to her, she said, um, that's the only way the world knows that I'm still alive, is that call for, from her volunteer. So that social isolation piece uh, is, is serious. And um, we don't wanna give up on people like Edith. So um, I think there are, are a lot of volunteers who've gone above and beyond to make sure that where it would have been a once a week thing, she'd check in on Edith. Now that volunteer's checking in seven days a week, sometimes even more than twice a day to make sure Edith is okay. And that's pretty remarkable. One of the other groups uh, beyond, you know, our really isolated senior population that we're worried about um, are the people who are caring for loved ones with dementia. Um, Really, the families uh, who are caring for people with dementia right now are feeling immense anxiety and stress. Usually, they're able to get short breaks from caring for their loved one with dementia because their person uh, with dementia would come to a day program or there'd be other services coming into the home. But right now, our adult day programs have had to close. Uh, and that respite care is not available. So it's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week slog. Um, and I think what's worse is that there's no end in sight. Nobody knows uh, when we're gonna be able to lift those restrictions and reopen our day programs. And without a light at the end of the tunnel, a lot of these families are really struggling to cope. Um, we, have, we have several caregivers who are so broken and so exhausted and in such dark places uh, that they've talked about suicide. Uh, we actually have some patients who have both dementia and COVID-19 and they don't understand uh, what's happening to them. They don't understand why they can't see their children and their grandchildren. And they don't understand why the people caring for them have to wear masks. For someone with dementia, that's very disorienting. Um, and that scares them and it creates a lot of fear and anxiety on the person with dementia. So that gets them agitated and, and you know, family members, uh, it's already an emotional job to take care of your person with dementia, but when they're agitated, that just makes it even worse. Um, we have many caregivers of people with dementia who had them on the long-term care list and are now in utter panic because they're worried the call is gonna come that a long-term care bed is available and they're gonna have to make that decision about whether to put their person living with dementia, their husband or wife of decades into a long-term care home. And as we all know, those long-term care homes are now the epicenters of this pandemic. So really, really tough choices people are having to make right now. Um, one of our caregivers, Maria, is um, home caring for her husband and, uh, and didn't have a lot of family support and other support. And we talked to her for an hour each morning just to get her to the point where she can get through the next 24 hours and our next support call. And we do that every day. 
So that's pretty real. And I think that we've seen the demands uh, for this kind of mental health support and caregiver support have just absolutely skyrocketed in the last four weeks. And we've had to redeploy staff uh, from uh, other areas of our organization to help with this. Um, we want to make sure that no caregiver is left behind. So we are doing those daily calls. We are doing porch drops of activities. We're doing virtual programming. Um, you know, you see all the parents who are working at home and have put their toddler in front of the TV for half an hour so they can check some emails. Well, we're doing that programming so that you can put your person with dementia in front of the TV to do an exercise class for half an hour. <laughs> um, so we have had to do a lot of pivoting, as Mike said, um, but we've done it and I think it's been successful. So the, they, they are things that we will carry on with after this is over. And finally, I'd just like to say a word about grief. Um, we do a lot of hospice care and bereavement support and um, care for a lot of people who are dying at home under normal circumstances. And uh, this pandemic has meant that many people are dying at home and dying at home alone and families aren't able to be there with their loved ones uh, when they're passing away. They're not able to gather. Um, they're not able to experience the rituals that normally bring comfort when a death occurs. Um, and our frontline healthcare workers are witnessing and experiencing a lot of sorrow every day. So one of the very small silver linings of this pandemic, I'm trying to find them, Mike, I'm trying to find these silver linings, <laughs> uh, has been the way that different organizations have come together to really respond to some of these things. Um, a great example is uh, we're working with the local hospices to provide greater hospice and bereavement support to retirement homes and long-term care centers right now, which are the sites of, of the biggest outbreaks, um, both to support the families of people who are living in those homes, but also to support the frontline workers there. Um, I think, you know, everybody has recognized that we're truly in this together and the only way we're gonna get through this pandemic is to look after each other. And so I'm really happy that I'm on the call this morning because I think no other organization embodies that better than the United Way. Um, really, the United Way is a glue that holds a lot of our community together. And it's been really impressive to see how the United Way has moved really quickly to support frontline organizations like ours as the crisis has developed. Um, and it's really showcased that we do have a strong and resilient social service sector and that a lot of that is due to the support of the United Way. So um, to all the donors on the call, I would just say thank you so much uh, for your support of the United Way. Um, because of you, Edith still has her volunteer and a brief moment of human contact every week. And Maria is getting the support she needs to get through another day of care with her husband. Um, and those people hardest hit by the pandemic, those who've lost loved ones to COVID-19 are gonna have the grief support that they need. So thank you so much. Uh, for everything you're doing. I hope that donating to the United Way gives you some purpose uh, during this difficult time. And thank you so much, Melissa. That was an incredible story and really shows how hard it is to get through this. I just want to remind people to please submit any questions you might have to Mike at uwhh.ca. We will be doing a live um, Q&A after Peter's presentation. So I want to welcome Peter Blumendahl. He is the Director of Clinical Services for the Canadian Mental Health Association Hamilton branch. He has spent over 12 years working directly with clients who experience serious and persistent mental health illness. He has spent years as a mental health first aid instructor, teaching members of the community how to effectively respond to mental health crises. In addition, Peter is the co-chair of the Regional Suicide Prevention Steering Committee for the Hamilton, Niagara, Haldeman, Norfolk branch region. Welcome, Peter. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about mental health and how the mental health sector has been affected by COVID-19. And uh, it's it's I always find it challenging speaking about mental health. And one of our models is mental health for all. So sometimes are we talking about our clients who deal with mental health struggles every day? Or are we talking about everybody that's on this webcast, everybody that's affected by a global crisis right now? And how is that affecting all of us? Um, and I kind of want to touch a little bit on both of those and uh, talk a little bit about the specific effect on frontline care providers who are being affected by this. Um, and I want to start a little bit by uh, sh also sharing a little story about one of the clients that I work with in the community um, that I think her story kind of wraps a lot of the themes together that I was going to discuss today. 
Um, I work with an individual in the community um, and do psychotherapy services for this person. And um, they're involved in groups here and they uh, utilize uh, many doctors and specialists and of uh, age of risk for COVID-19 and many different complex uh, physical and mental health needs. Um, and this person had uh, come down with an illness that put her under investigation for COVID-19 and had to quarantine for a couple weeks and waited for tests from public health to come back. And it took time for those tests to come back. Um, and through daily support and daily working with her, um, eventually we, we, we learned that she did not have COVID-19, which was such an unbelievable relief. Um, but she was so drastically affected by this as um, somebody under investigation where her whole, her, her whole resources were suddenly being coming stripped from her, her entire way of living and use, utilizing um, whether it's uh, going to groups, using food banks, going out in the community, now suddenly the community became unsafe. She's uh, somebody at high risk and has been told by the doctor, you can't, you still can't really leave your apartment because if you do, if you do get this thing, you could die. Um, so this is somebody I support with regularly and the kind of added factor to this is this is somebody who is currently on disability and was previously a nurse that worked in the hospital. And we talk a lot about, um, I'm just looking at your, your title here, local love in a global crisis. And I think a lot of what drives healthcare workers and social service workers is that feeling of identity of being a helping professional. This is what we live for. This is what is important to us. This is why we wake up every morning. It has become forged as a part of our identity. And uh, as I've been supporting this client, I had a very profound uh, moment and uh, working with her where she kind of just broke down a little bit and just said, I, I can't, I can't deal with the fact that I can't change anything. I can't impact the world. I'm a nurse. I want to go back to hospital and work, but I'm not allowed to. So there's this fundamental value conflict that's occurring between the, the frontline service providers that are trying to weigh the, the value of their own safety, the safety of their community, the safety of their family, and the needs of the people that they work with. Um, and that puts frontline workers in a place that I think is really vulnerable, really vulnerable for increased stress and anxiety. And stress and anxiety is something that we've had to put a lot of focus on around this pandemic. Um, we work with uh, a direct client base that deals with stress and anxiety on a daily basis. Um, for many of those clients, this pandemic has uh, amplified uh, a lot of those concerns. Um, and for, I think, the whole population, we're experiencing some signs of stress overload. It can be signs of fatigue. It can be irritability. It can be lack of sleep. Um, constant rumination, constant uh, checking our news feed all the time to get the latest information, um, things that keep us so fixated on this pandemic that we don't always take care of ourselves and take care of our mental health. Um, and our clients are experiencing it and we're experiencing as healthcare providers and it's become uh, a huge fundamental challenge. And amidst that, we are having to focus on how do we take care of ourselves and how do we take care of one another within the healthcare and social service sector. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, a new program that we've kind of pivoted to provide as we're not able to do face-to-face um, -face visits with the regularity that we could. It's, it's really only in emergencies that we're able to provide that. Um, we've developed a uh, phone counseling service for um, in collaboration with the United Way for any social service or healthcare provider that is affected by COVID-19, which is really something that's focused on personal wellness. It's focused on building resilience, reducing vulnerabilities, and um, building, uh, building a certain toolkit for ourselves to be able to be resilient and get through this um, and do it in a way that where we're supporting each other and taking care of our mental health. One thing that we're really trying to emphasize is that social distancing doesn't always have to mean social isolation. We can find other ways to be connected. It won't always be the same, but we will try to be, um, we'll, we'll still do things well, we'll just do them differently. And we're learning how to do that a little bit on our, on our front lines. Um, for our clients, uh, I, I think this has been touched on a little bit by other people 
uh, the experiences of accessing services, it's variable. You have some people who have great, great, they're very tech savvy, they're very able to adapt and hop onto Zoom and do Zoom appointments and um, it's, it's not too difficult. And then you have probably the most vulnerable people that we work with that not only don't have an internet or computer, they also don't have phones. Um, and we're trying to find them and they're in the shelters and they would regularly come to their door when they would need support and we'd give face-to-face -face visits and be able to connect them to services. And right now we're not able to, we're not able to meet the needs of those people and we're looking for ways to um, find cell phones with data plans, things that we can distribute to uh, individuals in our community that aren't able to access support remotely um, while we continue to try to keep our community safe. Um, so I guess that's just a little bit from me around the mental health side of things, and uh, I'm going to wrap it up here so we can take some questions. Thank you. Mike, your camera's off or your microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, we are accepting live questions right now. We're going to start the Q&A section of our uh, of our talk. So if panelists, if you can please turn on your video and audio, I'm going to do the same myself. Um, and anybody who um, submit any questions to mike at uwhh.ca. I just want to welcome Brenda Haidu. She's the VP of Marketing and Communications, and she's going to be sharing your questions with us. Thank you and welcome back panelists. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we have a few questions here, and uh, our first question is for Jamie. It's uh, with respect to volunteering. And Jamie, the question is, what can community do to help with volunteership at a time when the need for services is great? And if you could answer in about two or three minutes, that would be wonderful. It's hard to answer that question for all organizations, so I can only answer it for myself um, and for welcome in, um, because each organization is going to have different things that people can get connected with. Uh, welcome in, uh, we are still using volunteers to call our seniors and check in with them on a daily basis. We are still using volunteers when they are already doing their own grocery shopping to purchase additional essential items for seniors that they drop off and then we uh, welcome in and then we pack in the boxes. We are doing using volunteers for door-to-door, -door, select door-to-door -door deliveries, um, provided there's no direct contact. Um, so for us, and as another example, we still have a volunteer driving our truck to Hamilton Food Share once a week because that driver is the only one to step foot in that truck and we've just given them the keys. So there are different ways that you can get volunteers as, uh, involved, but for us it's a matter of making sure that each placement is safe and, and uh, reduces the risks for our volunteers. Thank, thank you, Jamie. Um, we have a, another question, and this question is for Peter. Peter, we're hearing a lot about COVID-19 also being a mental health crisis. What do you think the long-term impacts will be on the mental health and well-being of society? Um, that is a very uh, powerful question. Um, it's it's hard it's hard for me to really project what it could be. I do think that um, this era of social distancing is creating social isolation, and this is something we've heard from the others. And social isolation can lead to um, lifestyles that don't always foster wellness um, or, or a positive mental health. Um, it is certainly aggravating um, anxiety um oftentimes when uh, an individual will experience something traumatic um, and witness something that is incredibly stressful um, they can develop post-traumatic stress disorder or develop acute stress reactions to the incidents that are happening in the environment and we usually say you're actually experiencing a normal response to an abnormal event and what is abnormal is not your response your brain isn't trained to see this because we've never seen this before um, so 
when people aren't supported when they've experienced these things, they are at increased risk of de developing long-term psychiatric symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, which can be nightmares, aggravated sleep, irritability, hypervigilance, um, uh, and many, many others. Um, so I, 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 part of me says, I think we're gonna have to see what the, what the full impact is when this is over, but it's hard for me to see there being no impact. It's gonna absolutely impact the mental health of our communities. Thank you, Peter. We have another question, and uh, this question will be for Melissa. Um, uh, I am curious to hear more about the financial impacts on charities in our communities. Are they seeing a reduction in overall donations and from grantors? Yes, I would say that's the short answer. Um, I think, uh, as Jamie described, a lot of charities have had revenue sources that have had to stop or dry up. Um, and while, you know, for our organization in particular, we are serving uh, people with COVID-19. So we do have donors who are donating to help us buy PPE and all those things that we need to continue to provide care. Um, but we know that that will likely prevent them from donating. You know, their usual annual donation is now going to the COVID-19 response, which is absolutely wonderful. But all of those other things still need to continue. And I think that's the challenge the charitable sector is going to face um, as we emerge from this. Um, and as Jamie touched on as well, um, we're having we're losing those sources of revenue at a time when we're all providing more care rather than less so you know um, that's the challenge as well so I would say absolutely charities are feeling those effects and I know United Way has done a great job of advocating for us at various levels of government um, and will you know in order to get us some of those tools to survive this and, and come through the other side thank you Melissa our next question is for Mike. Uh, the question is, um, what are we seeing with uh, um, programs that already have wait lists and what is the United Way doing uh, with the um, investment decisions for the emergency funding? Yeah, so in terms of wait lists, you know, we're definitely hearing from our charities, as Melissa said, you know, demand is increasing. I mean, I think most charities were probably facing a situation where they were, you know, working in excess demand situations in, to begin with. And so I think in terms of, uh, of, of how we respond, you know, I think we're focusing uh, kind of two prongs. So, you know, we're focusing in on this emergency relief fund and we are we are raising money from individual donors like the people who are on this call right now. We are advocating for money to come in from the feds and, and, and from the province to make sure that we're thinking long term. And when it comes to making decisions, we're really trying to to be as collaborative with our other funding partners as possible because frankly there's not enough right now to go around and and so we're really trying to be as smart as we can with 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 where the, those dollars go right now so that we can kind of make strategic decisions and ensure that 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 any gaps are filled and it's it's actually really heartening to see you know we've done an incredibly simplified process for our, for our emergency relief we're seeing other funders pick up some of those things. So, you know, when we're unable to fund something, other funders are basically saying, okay, well, we can fund that one now. And, and they're not requiring those agencies to go through that process again. So we're trying to keep it as simple as possible, as collaborative as possible, and recognize that, that flexibility, that it's our agencies on the front line that have the expertise to, to make those decisions. So we want to sort of get out of the way and let them do their jobs and, and, and just facilitate that as best as possible. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we have one uh, time for one final question, and this one is for Brad. Brad, do you foresee uh, the outcomes of COVID-19 in this crisis impacting the way the overall charitable sector operates in the future? I think, uh, yeah, not just the charitable sector, but I think all sectors. I think this is, uh, has been a huge wake up call to us all to look at how we're operating um, and prepare for things that we didn't have on our radar. So I think the outcome of this, there will be some positives. I think 
we will become more nimble, we will become more flexible, we will find ways where we can pivot quicker um, so that we can adapt to situations like this. Because this may become our new norm uh, in the future as we see uh, viruses uh, change and, and, and get stronger as we go forward. So the charitable sector has been amazing at pivoting. Uh, you heard all three of these incredible panelists talk about that. And, uh, and what has been amazing has been the way everyone's been communicating with each other to help one another pivot. It hasn't been a you're on your own, you figure it out. Everybody's talking to one another, coming up with great ideas how we can support our communities and that's just been incredible. Thank you, Brad. We have several other questions that we will be addressing uh, following this webcast. Thank you for submitting those. Okay, thank you panelists. I'm gonna turn it over to Brad to kind of close us out. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. Great, thank you, Mike. And again, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us, sharing some of your stories and giving our listeners a glimpse into the realities that you are facing on the front lines. Uh, that was just some incredible stories from each and every one of you. This is a time when many organizations and individuals find themselves in a situation where they have to retreat, right? And this is a time when your United Way is rising up and working even harder to lift the community and people so that they can thrive in the future. We need to work together to transform our community. We cannot do this work alone. And everyone who is listening is an agent of change. We need each other so that we can overcome these massive barriers such as COVID-19. Because after all, that's what your United Way is all about. And one day well into the future, and in generations to come, this time will be looked upon in history. So let's continue to carve out that history so that everyone has the opportunity and support that they need. At a time when it's almost impossible to imagine how this world has slowed, the loss of life we've seen, the volatility of the economy, the stress and anxiety that we're all facing, I have such deep faith that this community and the people who live here are going to overcome this. I believe that amongst all this struggle, together we're going to gain wisdom and local love, and we will rise out of this stronger. So thank you for joining us. I hope this hour has been informative. Be safe, be healthy, and I look forward to seeing each and every one of you in the near future. Thank you for joining us.